Welcome to the pudding. The sweet proof of research to back up what you know about camp. Hi, I'm Dr. Mandy Baker, and my pronouns are she, her. And I am Travis Allison, he, him. Today, we're going to explore how we can be better at hiring good camp staff based on the research. Mandy, this topic is really relevant to people. It's something that they are very aware of, very stressed about, et cetera. And so I wonder for us, um, if we can, based on the research and all the work that you've done and the stuff that you learn all the time, all, all of the things that you're reading, um, what, who are the camp counselors right now? What do we need to know about this generation of people that we want to hire? Sure. Um, I think the it's important to have a good sense of who you're working with every time you do a piece of work. Um, I, when I talk about it in my research world, we talk about audience when we're writing a piece of work, a piece of research, or when we're writing for um, public or audience, we just constantly say, who is it, who is it, who is it? There's in fact a whole world of research about user design. Um, and when it comes to camp counselors, knowing who our hiring pool is gonna be made up of, um, and by knowing them, we're not talking necessarily about like individually profiling filing these people, but knowing as a population, what are their drivers and motivators? You know, what are the things that get them up in the morning and out of bed? And um, what are what are going to be the things that uh, draw them to working in camp environments? So we're mainly talking um, as a broad group about a generation. Yep. Um, sure. We're talking about millennials or known as Gen Z. Um, <clears throat> There's tons and tons and tons of research about this group of people. Um, from a sociologist's point of view, we often talk about eras of social interaction and yeah. the phenomena, the, the motivations and drivers at any given time. So a couple of important things to try to keep track of when it, we're thinking about this group or this actual social environment in which people are working. Yeah. Uh, the first is that they are people who have been preparing to work in um, a society that is changing and a workforce that is changing faster than they can anticipate. Yep. And that by itself has a lot of anxiety, a lot of, oh my goodness, I don't know what's coming. Um, but it also seems to have developed um, a strong sense of, I don't know if it's quite, I don't have quite the right words, but protectiveness or intelligence about choosing where they want to work mm -hmm. and the value to themselves in terms of working there. Yep. Uh, sometimes this gets accused as being egocentric yeah. um, or not being terribly community minded. Uh, there appears to be a less drive to be a citizen and to be contributing to a group or to a social environment. But you Isn't kind it of weird how when civilization lets you down, you don't uh, don't want to invest so in much it so about much <laughs> supporting civilization. Yeah, th well, yeah. yes, but then it's got its chicken and egg, right? Yeah, so the more people withdraw from civic life, the less people volunteer, the less people um, enter into social relationships, believing the best in everybody. Yeah. Um, the worse that the, you know, the more it falls apart, and the more um, I would say unsafe and unstable life feels. Yep. to folks totally. um it's partly you know one of those mental health strategies is to do acts of random kindness to other people uh, yeah. because it helps you get outside of your head and stop worrying about yourself so yeah. much yep. uh, it also helps you recognize that even on your shittiest day you have something of value to offer somebody else yeah so it, it, it is one of these chicken and eggs um yeah, it, unfortunately but it is a it's a strong theme that runs through this generation and how they think about work and how they approach the ideas of work um and they're looking out for themselves. Um, mm -hmm. Here's what's really fascinating about them looking out for themselves. They are looking out for themselves in terms of the value of experience and the relationships they'll build as much as a transaction of economics. So yes, they That's want to awesome be paid. What... It's so cool. And this is, I yeah. think this is part of, um, I think it's often positioned as a paradox or a contradiction. Yeah. This is a group of people that are actually quite activist in terms of social justice, but then they're equally accused of being egocentric. Right. <laughs> and it's like, hang on, hang on, actually. It's that they're basing their decisions on a set of criteria that's different than perhaps baby boomers or Gen Xs before them. And part of that is because they don't have a sense of being able to trust that society's just going to catch them. And that's right. just going to pick them yeah. up, that they've been let down by, in some ways, systems of politics and governance. They've been let down by uh, systems of 
you know, civility and civic um, participation. Yeah. And yeah. so um, it's rather than seeing these things as, you know, dichotomous and sitting opposite, they're actually two sides of the same coin, which is they're moving into an unstable future. Um, they're anxious about that. And so they're going to be strategic and make, about making choices that are going to support them and what they see as valuable. And what they see as valuable is not uniquely money. Although let's be honest, yeah. we're living in an age where a lot of these people know that they probably can't afford a house so yeah. making money is an important piece of the idea of security and stability yeah. so they're they're trying to build that they're trying to build stability in a very unstable social environment yeah. but they also are the type that will be looking for value in terms of all kinds of capital social yeah. cultural symbolic capital all these different kinds of capital and when we say social that means like networking is kind of the yeah. brutal word for it but relationships, relationships yeah. of value and benefit, mutually value and benefit. Um, so when we're talking about this group, the reason why we're talking about some of these motivators and drivers is it means that when we're trying to recruit them, we need to be appealing to those value sets, those motivators and drivers, and not keep relying on what worked for us. And by us, I mean, whatever generation you come from, if it's not Gen Z, it's yeah. recognizing that what motivates and drives a baby boomer and a Gen X is different. Thematically, it's, it, they're just different concepts, uh, neither better or worse, just different. Um, and often we operate with those assumptions in our heads that are so strong, we take it for granted. So we kind of have to go back and go, okay, what is it that really is valuable. So keeping this in mind, it means that when you're offering your value proposition in a recruitment space, right, and part of your recruitment strategy is being yeah. able to articulate actually the values that go beyond simply money. Yes, money is going to be important and it yep. needs to be fair, yeah. but it also needs to be um, talking about the kinds of like skills and ability benefits mm -hmm. and development that they'll be able to achieve. It's giving them language in a way to articulate those skills and abilities in a way that's going to help them position themselves for future professional work. Yep. And there's lots of research um, and, and some in particular that really highlights that most people that work at summer camp will as a seasonal during their high school university years have absolutely no intention of working there professionally as a year round or permanent job. Yep. So this is one of those uh, like misnomers. It's a bit mm -hmm. like people going to university thinking that if I get this degree, I'll get this profession. Yeah. And that's not quite how it works. Yeah. And I talk to my students about that when they come in my classes fairly early on. It's the only thing we can promise you is the opportunities and a rich environment for learning. If you guys don't do the work to put it into your brains, however that mystery works for each individual, and it is quite different, you know, yeah. intelligence works so different, then you don't walk away with anything. But if you do the work and you are able to put that education in your head, then you will have the market advantage. Yes, a qualification that speaks to that, but those skills and abilities that allow you to problem solve from complex, unpredictable environments, critical engagement. These are the, the university ones. Um, the camp ones aren't that different, no. um, but arguably maybe a little bit richer on the social and personal development side. So sure. the emotional intelligence and social perceptiveness, um, that tends to be a lot higher uh, through camp environments because that's a higher focus. It's a more yeah. intentional or intense. It might not be intentional, but intense social yeah. relationships. Yeah. yeah. So what we want to do when we're telling people, and there's lots of great research that can tell you lots of different things that camp counselors or outdoor leaders are able to develop in these environments, these work environments. Mm -hmm. We also want to be able to, in our recruitment strategies, make it clear to the individual how they can transpose, transfer, and articulate that for their future professions. Like I said, this is a generation that's looking for long-term stability, knowing they probably yep. won't get it. So helping them strategize how to pull that stuff out and speak to it for the long term is is actually quite helpful. And it'll right. draw them to want to work more with us. Right. Which is interesting because um, one of the things that I have noticed um, is that this is the whole camp industry, not just hiring, that the harder things get, the more people will fall back on things that they have done before mm -hmm. um, while well, ignoring the fact that that never worked anyway. 
Um, <laughs> There's that. Yeah. I mean, it didn't have to work as hard then as you need it to work now. But one of those things is um, people advertising camp jobs is come and spend a fun, su a fun summer in the sun. Yeah. And that is not motivating. And because there are some real trust issues about communication between generations, um, you know, this um utopic vision of what camp, summer camp jobs can be the, everybody's like yeah we know that's not the case like, <laughs> well, it, there is some fun is, and some sun yes but... and then there's the hard work yeah yeah, yeah. I, I think this is this is a generation that is um I'll, well i'll say it they're they're critical enough and insightful enough to call bullshit yeah. Um, and they are a bit <laughs> over, they're a bit over the fact that there tends to be in a lot of different components of our lives, um, there tends to be this um, rhetoric that runs the surface, the superficial, mm -hmm. and then there tends to be this reality. Yep. And camp for a very long time, um, and still does, runs this rhetoric. Most of the people who work in camps for any kind of extended period of time is very aware of the reality there seems to continue to be a fear to speak honestly about what the reality is yeah. in any kind of advertising, marketing, mm -hmm. face saving kind of way. Yeah. And I mean, if you grew up with Trump in the background yeah, and you have listened to adult commentary about the nonsense of that kind of governance rhetoric, and I'm using Trump because um, it's an exaggerated example, but sure. this kind of yeah. rhetoric here, reality here, I mean, we can talk about Ford governments, we can talk about French government, we can talk about the British government. I mean, we've seen this happening in governance in a yeah. major uh, television entertainment as well as right. news kind yeah. of way. If you've grown up in that generation, listen to the adults in your life uh, criticize and, and often very intelligently and quite rightly that kind of rhetoric versus the kind of reality you have this kind of group of critical uh, or critiquing <clears throat> is well-practiced. The catch, of course, and this can be frustrating for managerial generations, is they lack the life experience to understand what anchors that and sure. what grounds it and when and when to step into it and when not to. So I have right. this sometimes with my students where they, they come in and that is the worst idea ever. And I'm a little like, okay, let's, <laughs> let's unpack this and yeah. understand what of this is really bothering them yeah. versus the, that kind of exaggerated, like they're the worst, the worst <laughs> politician ever. And you're like, yeah. well, they're kind of a mix of all kinds of things. And you have to keep in mind, there's all those dynamics that run yeah. behind the scene, right? So it's very similar. We uh, at camps have relied on, oh, it'll be fun um, to work at camp and it'll be better than an office job. Yeah. And the truth is, it is and it isn't. Yep. You know, an office job, yep. you finish at a certain hour, say four in the afternoon, five in the afternoon, and you're done. Yep. You didn't have to leave home. You can hang out with your usual friends. Um, you know, you, you can rest as much or as little as you want. You can mm -hmm. go to a party with different friends each night. You know, like yeah. there's, um, but arguably the re repetition and the tediousness of the kinds of office jobs young people can get for a summer contract. Yeah. Okay, it's frustrating, a little limiting. You can't stretch your legs. You may not be able to develop as many skills or abilities. Yeah. Um, whereas the trade-off is, okay, you're in an intense, immersive environment. I can't. But my goodness, your uh, political diplomacy, your social perceptiveness, your emotional intelligence, whether you like it or not, as long as you are open to the learning process, you will grow. You'll develop yeah. and you'll yeah. improve. So the other problem with the whole idea of it's fun in the sun, mm -hmm. it's a bit of a 17 or 18 year olds perspective. And we yeah. seem to be as 40, 50, 60 year olds advertising the 17 year old perspective. Yeah, it's, I think it's okay to share the 40, 50, 60 year old perspective of it's challenging. Here's where the challenges lie. Um, here's the reward. Here's yeah. the potential for development. Um, and I think the other part about the fun in the sun, it has been used for probably a century, mm -hmm. a century, but not a whole heck of a lot more. And I can talk historically about it to justify poor remuneration.
right. and, and exactly. not necessarily the greatest working conditions. No yeah. privacy. You get to hang. Like I have, I have two kids, and yeah. I can't wait for them to go to bed so I can have a little moment where it's like, huh, let alone eight <laughs> kids, and and I don't sleep in the same room as my kids. Like, yeah. you know, yeah, you yeah. think about the summer camp experience. It's it's intense, and most parents wouldn't even say yes to that. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, I think this is a generation who are disenfranchised by the idea of BS um, right. and who will actually be more interested in working with uh, a camp who is honest and genuine. Um, and and arguably, if you're being genuine about here are the challenges, you would be sitting there with a, and here's all the strategies we have for supporting you through those challenges. Or we've seen these challenges for decades this is what we've developed to, to see people through. Right. All right. So if we understand um, their motivations and drivers, sure. have we talked enough about that? Is there more you want to say about what motivates them and or no, even we... how we appeal to like, even, I mean, we're going towards the, the, the work that AC is doing so hard yes. right now on Project Real Job. Yes. Is there, it's worth talking, we acknowledge that all of the work they're doing and how well they're doing it. Um, is it worth talking about how we talk about camp so that it's more appealing to work there? I think being real and being yeah. honest is mm -hmm. um, the first and probably foremost. Um, and then I, I, I think the real and honest also should be equally paired with um, what are the realistic expectations of skills and abilities that you'll develop that are going to be not just useful, but sort of market advantage when you are applying for your first professional jobs, yeah. whether that's straight out of university or straight out of high school or some varying degree of post-secondary education or not. It's it's being able to be clear about the opportunities to develop those wanted, desirable work skills um, for future profession. And here's the, I mean, this is maybe the irony. This thing's been bouncing around in my head for <laughs> several yeah. years, maybe a decade at this point is there's been multiple reports, including a significant one out of Deloitte's in 2017, talking about future skills and employability. Yeah. Yep. And what skills are going to be necessary, required, essential, beyond and into the future with technology and digitization of jobs, automation of jobs happening. And what we can automate right now and digitize, the things we can do that with tend to be rote, technical, yep. practical. Yep. Um, we haven't been overly as a society um, successful at replacing social and emotional intelligence uh, and yeah. interactions in relationships. Right. Look, this is early days. We're testing out some new ideas. Um, the American Camp Health Association is testing out digital empathy as a tool, which is kind of a fascinating wow. idea. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But they're using it as a screening tool, as a way of uh, anticipating camper needs is the way that right. they're currently right. using it. So, uh, you know, I, I see that and I think, oh, I can't wait for the data. Get me the data. I want to see yeah. how this works. Yeah. Um, I don't know that the intention is to replace relationships, it's to enhance them so right. that camp counselors and campers have an awareness prior and during what's going to make that kid tick and what's going to be successful. And I appreciate that when I sign my kids up to camp and they say, yeah. what's going to make your camp campers yeah. experience the best? I'm like, do this, do this, watch out for these ones. This is the button, you know? Totally. Um, yeah. And I think um, parents and children who have an, uh, an honest awareness of themselves are really going to help camps be amazing because right. we can hand you the toolkit. Okay. Here's the three triggers and here's the three, you know, praise points that are going to always work. Yeah. So, um, you know, what we know though is working at camp gives you opportunity to develop a lot of those personal interpersonal skills and abilities. Yeah. And it does it in a live learning environment. If it's well supported Instant by feedback management. And Oh my goodness. And instant yep. trial. Yeah, That's, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the kid melted down. So that doesn't work. <laughs> um, we'll try it again. They didn't yeah. melt down so much this time. So right. two things have happened. You got the feedback of how to be successful. And two, you learned this idea of like success is not a hit the, the button or not. Success right. is scaffolded. It's yeah. a, a process of building, yeah. building, building, building. Yeah. Um, so there's all these amazing things um, these skills are desperately needed in the world and will survive technological evolutions for a much longer period than, say, a technical skill. Yeah. Um, 
you know, we used to belay. Now you can have automatic belay devices. Like well, mm. what I'm saying there is technical skills can often be replaced even in a camp environment. So right. um, what we're doing is actually future proofing. That's yeah. one of the words. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and when we're speaking to when we're recruiting and when we're training and when we do our performance appraisals and we're doing performance management steps, when we do the exit interview, whether that's, you know, at the end of camp, or a couple months after we get a chance to breathe this at each touch point in what would be a traditional HR or human resource management, these should be the conversations. Okay, what do you, how, where do you think you can take those skills in the future? How would that help you with your future profession? You want to be a doctor? Tell me about that. How are you going to use this ability to question and listen in a diagnostic situation? Um, you know, or you want to be a, a social media influencer? What did you learn about an entire camp community that helps you to be able to speak in a way that's engaging on a social media platform? Yeah. If you can't do it with 200 people in a live environment, you're going to have a hard time doing it with 200,000 in a virtual environment. Yeah. So, I mean, regardless of the career aspirations of the people who join our staff, um, what they're doing there is a really amazing training ground, like you said, and an instant and a like, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. it has its natural feedback, even I'm, I'm always hopeful that management will do an amazing job of supporting and talking to their staff and helping sure. develop them. But I get it. Can't let's be too. real. Yeah. yeah, really hopeful. Um, <laughs> camp is busy and intense. Yeah. The good news is the feedback is already going to come. Yeah. The difference is you're helping your staff process feedback and make sense out of it. So right. it doesn't always have that part doesn't always have to have to be instant. What you want your staff doing so you can recap is maybe jotting a few notes down each day. What worked, what didn't work one a day. And then you see them in a week uh, rather yeah. than expecting management to be on it every second of every day. Anyways, the point of all this is to um, say that when you're hiring all the way through all the HR touch points, this conversation of your future proofing, your employability, right. which is your right. ability to be employed in the future, no matter how uncertain. And guess what happens when you do that? You build confidence. You right. build a sense of self-efficacy. The the staff actually start to feel the sense of, I can influence the world around me. Yeah. I can have a, not, I can't control the world, right. but I can, I can respond to and survive. And so it builds this kind of confidence and guess what's easy to hire? Confidence, you know? Yeah. It, it, but great. Yeah. Com yeah. It's amazing. Right. Confidence gives you the ability to take risks. It confidence gives you the ability to fail. Confidence gives you the ability to hope and be optimistic and try again. Um, and those are the kinds of people we want to hire into uncertain work futures. Right. The, the, there's a couple things that that float up for me on this part of the you know how do we talk about the value to them um, uh, of this and and how do we find them. Um, one of the differences for me for camp work versus office job um, is that hopefully in most camps, um, you have the ability to have some input. So yeah. if you go to an office job and you're getting coffees and making copies, then you don't yeah. get the same kind of input as you hopefully do at a camp where you can put up your hand and say the thing that you're naturally inclined to and use that power yeah. of perception of the world. The other thing that you're talking about, an older research paper, IBM came out with a paper about the impact of AI this fall, and okay. it was the same thing. So that the skills that, that are not going to be as necessary include all the ones you said before, but anything also with an, any form of evaluation um, mm. is a degraded skill uh, in an AI world because the AIs are probably able to do that. But the things that people and businesses will be looking for that we can communicate, problem solving, leadership, communication, working in a team, um, you know, creative applications of the things we've learned, all those things are all stuff that we can also sell um and yep. search for um this is a whole topic i understand but yeah. i wonder i wonder where we or how we get to you know it's like how do we see the people who have the potential for this sure. or are willing to do the work to become this kind of leader um because we might be hiring 15 16 year olds some camps do let's most yep. kids are hiring 18 year olds and older but still even then we need to see potential in people um, so that, that's a whole big topic. I don't want to spend any more time on. Um, but I want to, I want to ask one more question before we sign off today. Um, like it's, it's really quite 
relative to that, how do we screen for it? Where do we, we, we know all of the things we understand the potential that could be realized with time at camp and time with responsibilities, but how do we screen for it? How do we find that out? Well, <laughs> um, this, I, like you said, this is a huge topic of recruitment. Where do we find them? How do we find them? How do we engage them? And then once we've done that, how do we pick through and, and find the right people? Um, like you said, a parking lot, maybe that's our next episode. We'll, we'll sure. talk more about that and come back to it. Yeah. Um, I, th I think from my perspective, you use the right word, which is the idea of potential. No. So um, especially when we're hiring younger um, folks, they have less evidence because they have less experience. They can't tell you about a time where they led a group because this might be the first group they ever lead. Well, it's first kind of, job. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and the interesting part is camps take risks all the time hiring first jobbers. Yep. You know, this yep. is kind of what we do. And we we take those risks based on our assessment of potential. Um, of their ability, their openness to learning, their uh, uh, which involves the ability to take criticism and make something constructive out of it. And criticism, I don't mean d destruction, I mean no. constructive feedback. Um, can they absorb that? Can they make sense out of it? Do they respond well to it? So this ability, this potential is about an ability to learn. And I think when you meet folks that have closed off to the opportunity or the option of learning, you're mm. going to be hard pressed to have them in your camp environment. And it doesn't matter how many lines on their CV they have. If they yeah. are not open to that ability to learn and to learn on the fly and to problem solve on the go and to the willingness to take a risk and screw it up because we know that we can't always get it right, especially when we're working with humans, kids especially, they're a little bit like, oh, Oh, I didn't see that one coming. Great. Cool. We're having a meltdown and I, I'm going to have to sort this out. So um, I think that's kind of, you set your criteria of what is, what is potential. Um, right. And I would invite every team management to have a brainstorm of what potential looks like. Mm. Um, and I think that's where we let ourselves down when we go to the recruitment is that we yes. go in with philosophical ideas of what we want, but right. we don't anchor behavior. What does that look like in behavior? Yeah. So, I mean, in, in my household, we have this conversation about um, words and actions, words and actions, because yeah. people yeah. are coming to interviews have got all the words. They practice the words. They ask AI to write the words. The G chat totally. GPT will tell you your words. In fact, yeah. a lot of cover letters are being written by AI. Yeah. At the end of the day, what we want to do is be able to see the actions that fit or mirror or represent the criteria that we've set for our camp. And every camp's gonna have slightly different criteria based on what their goals and outcomes are. I think yeah. we've talked about this before. Camp has to be clear about what their mission and vision is. What's my vision? What's my mission? How I, my vision, what do I wanna do? My mission, how am I gonna get there? Yeah. And then that needs to be reflected in everything you do. So that includes your position descriptions, that includes your hiring questions, that includes how you screen the cover letters. And ultimately, I think what you should be screening for is not pretty words, but examples that demonstrate action. Yeah. So a, a, a new 14 or 15 year old has worked in teamwork, group work before. They've sure. been doing it all the way through their schooling. Yeah. They've done it on teams and clubs. Um, they've done it. And what you want to ask is not, did you go to this club? Right. But what did you do? Yeah. And it's asking those questions of, what role do you play in a social group? So tell me about this club. Are you a loud upfront leader? Are you the behind the scenes supporter? Do you do administration? Do you just show up and leave? How many people do you talk to when you're there? These are all behaviors. So we set out potential. We set up what that potential looks and sounds like based on our mission and our vision. Mm -hmm. We then set up a new column. No joke, I do this in tables when I help folks sort these things out. And we write down what the behaviors look like. Right. A handful of examples. We're mm -hmm. never going to get them all. There's lots of different behaviors. We write three or four examples of what that looks like in action. And then we screen looking for that. What are the actions? So then when someone comes into an interview and they say, I am an amazing upfront leader, you say, what does that look like? Can you give me an example of that in action? Do you have any pictures? Do you, can you show me your social media feed? Do right. you have any video? Because, I mean, we live in a world where there's evidence of action everywhere. Yeah. And just to wrap this up with a cute little family story, 
my kids are responsible for getting themselves up and, and out in the morning. And I try to keep my fingers out of that as much as possible. Cause I know that if I do too much, they become overly reliant on me. My kids mm. are primary school education. So yeah. there is a risk of me wanting to manage their mornings and make sure they don't miss their bus. And there's always an impact for all of us. I'm going to be helping them get to school if they miss their bus. But when my kids and especially my youngest go, yeah, I had breakfast. I'll go, I don't see any evidence. What do you right. mean? Well, if you actually did the thing you said you did, there would be a dirty bowl on a counter in a dishwasher. If no. you did the thing you said you really did, there would be crumbs or milk yeah. spill. Yeah. There's evidence of our actions. And we live in an age where this generation actually records a lot of the evidence of their actions. Yeah. Um, so the cool part about it is, is that we should be able to ask for evidence of action and they can provide it. Right. You might have to steer them towards it. Be a bit creative. Sure. Do you have a picture? Do you have a, and, um, and then you will be able to put all those pieces together, potential and action together. Right. Th that is a perfect spot to put a pin in this episode, Mandy. Thank you for sharing all of these things and giving us so much to think about, but also hope. I think this is a, a hopeful discussion um that we can do it it's just a, you just have to have a camp professional level of intention with this to make it yeah. in it to make it work and it can't be a thing that you can shortcut um but you're doing it in all sorts of other things so i think you can do it here too yeah absolutely yeah. Yeah. yeah and this is the cool part is or the contradiction we're really yeah. really good at growing personal character interpersonal strengths in other people Right. So we should be able to apply it to yep. ourselves and to our yep. staff and do it, you know, and do it in a fun, hopeful, even play-based way, right. you know, brainstorming with other people about what potential looks like. That can be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, if people have questions, follow up, how do they get in touch? Um, you can get me at getlant at gmail.com. I do have my website up. It's Lamped Research. If you want to find that email again, if you just couldn't tuck it away in your brain that quick. <laughs> L-A-M-P-E-D. That's the one, at gmail.com. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mandy. I appreciate that. If folks have uh, ideas for suggestions, um, we'd be grateful if you filter that stuff through me. And I'll pass on to Mandy and she and I'll figure out how we're going to talk about it, et cetera. And um, you can do that at Travis at GoCamp.pro. And folks, if you didn't know, now you know. <laughs>